Hey YouTube, before we jump into the video, make sure you check out my Patreon account. It's designed for serious medical aesthetics providers just like you. Hello, Julie. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm well. I'm very good. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. This is really exciting. It's a big pleasure from my end. So before we begin, for people who somehow are not aware who Julie Horn is, I'll do a little mini introduction. So Julie Horn is a registered nurse. She's originally from Sweden, but she has been working kind of like all over the place. But your hub is based in Norway, right? It was, yes. It was, okay. So, and she's the owner of uh, Julie Horn Academy. Basically, there are physicians and nurses from all over the world that travel to see her specifically for her internationally known lip technique. And now she's doing lots of international training. She's all over the place. She's in Canada, she's in the States, she's in Europe, she's in Australia, she's in South Africa. Uh, what, did I miss anything? No, <laughs> You're everywhere. Really. You're doing well. You're doing very well. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. I'm doing okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I was based in Norway, um, but about three years ago, I packed my bags and I moved to South Africa, to Cape Town. And uh, I started a business together with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Felix Bertram. He's a dermatologist from Switzerland. So we started an academy, training academy together in Switzerland. So I'm nowadays mainly based in Cape Town and Switzerland. Like you said, I travel all over the place and I love it to see the world, to see my beautiful colleagues all over from all these countries and continents. It's, it's a dream come true to be able to do this. I'm so blessed. I mean, you exploded on this scene. Like you haven't, how long have you been in medical aesthetics for? Not so long, actually. It's, uh, it's a little bit over seven years now. I mean, that's amazing, right? So. If People are following us. I think most of my followers or a lot of them are either injectors or they're just starting off and they like to, you know, see some inspiration. This is one of the reasons why I do these videos. It's just to let people know, like if you're dedicated to this and if you want to go all in, like lots can happen and doesn't you don't have to you know, it doesn't have to take 10, 20 years for you to get noticed. Like you can you can get noticed if you really work hard and uh, if you put in the work and and great things will happen to you. And I'm really proud of you, Julie. Like, honestly, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, when I took your online course, it was amazing. You're not only intelligent, but you're articulate and you, you represent your brand really well. People just seem to like, you know, shine when they're around you. So thanks for joining us. That's so lovely. Thank you so much, Dan. And I have to give you credit as well. You have an amazing account. I also know you have an amazing YouTube channel and you share you. your knowledge and so, I mean, hats off to you as well. You're doing an amazing job out there, sharing your knowledge. Yeah, 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 I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so how did you get into medical aesthetics and how did you kind of like specialize or know that you wanted to go really into lips? Good question. Uh, I do have a story to tell regarding that. So, I mean, I was the first person uh, when I went to school to start wearing makeup. I was the first one putting mascara on my lashes. It always interested me for some reason, you know, the appear appearance to look good in a way. So I started wearing mascara first in my class. Then I started to pick my eyebrows, which I really, really regret today because I picked too much and, you know, the hair didn't grow back out. So I look like, uh, you know, I have short <laughs> brows. So I had to do the the microblading look. stuff, too, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I wish I didn't. But I started very early age, you know, to to not transform really, but to do something to improve uh, what I thought was improving my appearance. So. And then I was very interested in aesthetic overall. I followed many accounts. I did a lot of research online and I was born with very thin lips myself. Both my mom and my dad, they have very thin lips. And when I smiled, when I was younger, when I say younger, I would say I was, you know, in early teens, I really was self-conscious about my smile because when I smiled, it was teeth and nothing else. So I, Every time I smile, I was like, ha, 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 you know, covering. So when I first turned 18, I felt like, okay, this is something that is bothering me. So why not do something about it? And I did all this research and I wanted to go to someone good. So I did a lot of online research and I found a clinic, four hours drive 
from where I live in Sweden or lived. And I thought it's worth the trip. I wanted to go to someone experienced. So that was my first experience. I went to that clinic in Stockholm and I went in there and it was this beautiful clinic and they had these beautiful lab coats on. And um, by then I was already studying to become a nurse at the university in Örebro in Sweden. So when I stepped into this clinic and I, you know, experienced all this and she helped me and we did just a little bit just to give me a little bit of an upper lip. And, you know, I felt so confident go walking out from that clinic. It was like life changing for me. And I couldn't stop, you know, looking at myself in the mirror. I smile, I smile. Oh, look, I have an upper lip. So it really in some way changed my life. It sounds for some people who are not in this industry, maybe, oh, come on, stupid. So much more important things in life, you know, your health, this and that. But I was healthy. I didn't have any, you know, that to relate to. And this was something I was self-conscious about. And I thought, why not? And I did it. And it was the best experience of my life. Gave me so much confidence. And that was when I was thinking, okay, one day, this is what I'm going to do for a living. This is what I would like to do to help, you know, people become more confident because confidence leads to a lot more in life. So that's the journey that really, you know, got me into this aesthetic. Yeah. Amazing. You know what? I had a completely opposite experience when I first got my first lip training course. I went well, it was really interesting because I drove out of town. I went to this person who I was specifically learning to do lips for, but the lips that she did weren't really my style. They were really blown up. And at the same time, I was new. I was really new in the field and I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of anatomy questions I want. And every time I asked a question about anatomy or how deep or she couldn't answer. And her qu- answer was like, you know, I don't know. They're like anatomy stuff. It's not really my thing. I can tell you where to place it and how to make it a good lip. And that really didn't resonate well with me. And I just kind of like left, you know, with a little sour taste in my mouth. And then whenever I saw your training course after, I was like, this is the one. Like Julie is going to be teaching. And not only that, you also partnered with Kodafana, which you had like a really nice base for anatomy. And again, that was kind of like my thing. I really needed to understand the anatomy base, not only just the, you know, aesthetic part. And it was like, it was just, it was perfect. It was really, really great. And I really appreciated that course. So. When we are talking about Sebastian Cotofana, I have to say he taught me so much regarding the anatomy of the lips, regarding the different components of the lips, the small fascias that not everyone is aware about. By learning so much anatomy from him in detail, it really helped me to, in some way, improve my technique. Okay, next question. So... For us, a lot of people, whenever they're transferring their fillers, we transfer a lot of times into like a BD syringe. We feel like basically it gives us a little bit more control. You know, the needle's smaller. I know that's not your thing. And I want to know, ideally, what's your perfect needle, gauge and size and why? Good question. I have a good answer on this. And to be honest with you, so I... I have no problem with people using a BD syringe. For me, what's most important is that the injector feel confident in what they're doing to be able to do the precise, you know, small, precise work. So if they struggle with using a half inch needle and a long syringe, then why not, you know, put it into a BD syringe if they feel they have more control. I have nothing against that. And if people love that, they should continue doing that. If they feel they get good results out of it, just keep continue doing that. My issues with the BD syringes is all the fickling before, you know, to put it into these small syringes. And the tip of the needles usually get blunt very quickly. That's why you just fill the needles with a little bit so you... You know, you have to fill up many, many needles. And the thing is with these BD syringes is, I guess they come in half inch length as well. But I see many work with these short BD syringes with a shorter needle. And for me, I like the the half inch size because I can reach bigger areas through one injection point. So less trauma. So I can reach areas. I use the whole length of the needle to angle different directions. And I guess I'm so used to using the original syringe with the original needle. So everything is about, you know, what you're used to. 
So I guess if I was trying a BD syringe, it would be a little bit thickly for me in the beginning. So I really don't have, you know, there is no rules regarding what needle to use. Use what works for you and your patients. Actually, I am producing my own lip needles at the moment. Oh, very yes. cool. Yes. So hopefully they will be available on the market uh, quite soon. Skin needle and also a specific one for lips. And that needle is something that I feel we are missing in our industry. And if I feel that I'm missing something and I am a passionate person and, you know, I love to be busy and I love to be innovative and therefore why not produce them yourself? So that's what I'm doing at the moment uh, together with some partners in Australia. And uh, we will start advertising this quite soon and reveal the secret behind these very, very specific and special needles, which I think people will love. Amazing. Okay, so the next question, we talked it a bit on it when you mentioned you had thin lips. Um, realistically, how much can someone fill their lip and make an expansion until it's likely going to cause some trauma or some damage down the road? Because right now we're seeing, you know, the occasional client that comes in and their lips are just way too big. And I always wonder, sheesh, what's going to happen to these clients like 20 years down the road? Are they going to lips have to like hang down here? Are they constantly going to have to have them filled? Are they going to have to have surgery? And that's because they've just expanded it so much. So for me, like, I don't know, I'm always wondering how much is too much? And do you have kind of like a chart where you say you can kind of go from here to here, but not too much more? I usually tell my patients that there is an anatomical limit of how much filler you can fit into a pair of lips. And everything is depending on the original anatomy that the patient come in with. So if you have thinner lips to begin with, you have less space to play with. So when it comes to very thin lips, uh, I see some injectors they do the mistake of trying to expand the tissue too quickly because the patient maybe has very thin lips and then, you know, it's not rare that the patient, you know, have a photo showing, I want these lips. And they are like full, lush, you know, averted, mwah, juicy lips. And then as professionals, we understand that it's not possible to reach that goal, not even over years or not even if you include surgery in addition it might not be possible at all to, to reach that goal. So you need to sit down and have this. Sometimes it can be quite a tough conversation to have with your, your patient. And to bring in another amazing colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Tim Pierce from the UK, Manchester. He is like the guru of patient psychology, how to have this talk with patients to make them feel safe and to make them understand you know, without them being, you know, oh, okay, I don't believe you or talk to patients without, you know, seeming salesy. I know, I so, think he could have been like a psychiatrist or psychologist in his other oh, field. Yes. Oh, to. yes. Yeah. So now, so then we have to have that talk with the patient. So when I have a patient that have very, very thin lips, I try to talk to them, please don't have the goal of having big lips. Because if you have very thin lips to begin with, there are, of course, room for improvement. There are room for getting a little bit more fullness. I mean, I had very thin lips and I mean, I'm not huge, mm -hmm. but I have lips, but it's, it's a journey. So we have to make the patient understand it's not a session or two, it's a journey over time. So when I have very thin lips, uh, it's not uncommon that I choose to inject only 0.2. 0 0.2 milliliter in the first session because there is that limited space i am injecting in a more or less close compartment of the lips which means below the white roll i'm only injecting in the red component of the lip because the white roll is a structural adhesion and it works as a barrier i'm in front of the orbicularis oris muscle and i'm above the fascia in the wet dry junction so it's a little space we have to work with. So I'm slowly expanding that space with maybe 0.2 milliliter. Then we wait a few weeks. We add another 0.2. So slowly, slowly build up the lips. And as soon as I start to see that the lips starting to look quite expanded, because it's also important that the lips looks natural in animation. 
So even if the lips are thin and you, if you inject a full syringe in a very thin lips, it can be very stiff and sausagey and, you know, the animation is weird. So slow, slow, steady. With and when small, you say point two, or is that point two in the upper lip or is that point two in everything? In everything. With oh, really? Very, so point with zero five in everything. In each with these very thin lips, yeah. Okay, but sometimes it's 0.3, sometimes it's half a syringe. You know, it's depending on what space we have to work yeah. with. I and think how long that, between the injections do you think you can wait for them to create enough space to try and put a little bit more? I have like, I want them to wait at least four weeks in between every session. So they are completely healed. I don't want any kind of local inflammation going on. Uh, so minimum four weeks between the first and second session and then i make them wait maybe a couple of months eight weeks until the third session so i you know it's a long journey right. um, with the patient so i try to to make them understand that it's not a quick fix it's a journey if you want them to look natural uh, during the process and the end result okay i think we're good thank you so much julie this is amazing thank you dan this is, was a pure pleasure Yes, yeah, this is super fun. Okay, thanks again. Thank you. And thank Take you, care. everyone who watched us today. I saw a few that I know very well. And mwah to all of you. Big heart. <laughs>